I'm going to tell you a story of how a casual snorkel on a Caribbean coral reef, one beautiful day at the end of summer, opened my eyes to a terrifying and newly emerging threat to coral reefs. And I'll apologize in advance because though I'm talking about coral reefs, which are one of the most beautiful ecosystems on the planet, this isn't really a happy story. And if I'm being completely honest, the outlook for coral reefs of the future is grim. The story I'll tell you today is not one of optimism, but instead one of alarm. And I'll confess that something I struggle with when talking about my life's work is how to tell the story without causing despair, because that is not the goal. My goal is to introduce you to a new villain in the story of coral reefs struggle to survive. My goal is to raise awareness to this emerging threat, and ultimately, it's a call to action. The setting for my story and where I first met this new villain is an island group on the Caribbean coast of Panama, Bocas del Toro. Bocas is a vibrant community and a backpacker's dream destination with tropical beaches, coral reefs, and pumping surf. But another story lies hidden beneath the surface of these serene waters. Lurking at the deepest depths of the seemingly tranquil water is a pool of oxygen depleted water. This villain is ocean deoxygenation a threat that has the potential to wipe out virtually all living creatures on a coral reef in a matter of hours. But I won't leave you hanging with the feeling that there's nothing we can do for coral reefs and there's no hope. I'll finish this tale with some tractable solutions, things that you can do in our fight to save coral reefs. I'm a coral reef ecologist, and I'm fortunate to have spent time with some of the healthiest and happiest coral reefs on the planet. These reefs have a lot going for them, they have plenty of top predators like sharks that keep the ecosystem in check, lots of happy corals that carpet the sea floor, and a wide variety of colorful inhabitants. It may not come as a surprise that the one thing that these reefs are missing is people. In the middle of the ocean where there are no local populations or immediate sources of pollution is where we find the healthiest remaining reefs. So not only do I study coral reefs, but I also study how they're changing in today's ocean, how they're going from a colorful, vibrant metropolis to a drab, desolate wasteland. And this is where our story takes a darker turn. The global environment is changing at a rate that's faster than any we've witnessed in our planet's history. And it's changing so fast, it outpaces the ability of nature to adapt. An indisputable fact is that we're losing coral reefs rapidly. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that my children may never see a healthy coral reef. More than 70% of the world's reefs have already been lost or soon will be. But this global decline and loss of coral reefs is probably not news to you. The antagonist though is people. More specifically, the drastic way that we've been changing the environment that makes some habitats inhospitable. The fossil fuels we've been burning through since the Industrial Revolution have upset the natural balances that have existed on our planet for centuries. You may have heard of ocean warming, which is often talked about with coral reefs, because warm temperatures can cause mass coral mortality, and if it stays too warm for too long, we get mass bleaching events. You may have even heard of ocean acidification. This is the increasing acidity of the ocean because of fossil fuel emissions that are essentially causing osteoporosis of our coral reefs or the dissolution of the reef architecture. Now to my horror, we're witnessing a new bad character emerge. We've known about this one for a long time because it's caused reoccurring dead zones across the world like we see in the Gulf of Mexico, but unfortunately it's decided to rear its ugly head in the tropics. Enter ocean deoxygenation, also sometimes referred to as hypoxia. It's essentially the same thing. It means the loss of oxygen from our oceans. So why is this happening? Why does it matter? And importantly, what can we do? The surface of the ocean is chock full of microscopic plants called phytoplankton. Like plants on land, they harvest energy from the sun and form the base of the food chain. But also like plants, they grow a lot better and faster when they're fertilized by nutrients. Nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen make their way into the ocean as water runs off from land. Excess nutrients and the pollutants we've put in the soils to help improve our crops are going to the oceans, and this is causing a runaway bloom of phytoplankton. Eventually, those microscopic plants die, they sink to the seafloor, 
bacteria and other microbes eat the dead plant material, and when they're doing that, they consume oxygen that's available. They're essentially sucking it down. During periods of low wind activity and little water movement, the pool of oxygen depleted water grows and grows and grows. And then all of this is made worse by warming temperatures. So what we have is a global environmental change, warming, that makes this local scale pollution even more severe. I'll be honest, deoxygenation is not something I've studied for a long time. I have been working in coral reefs for about 15 years, but it wasn't until a few years ago that we came face to face. So let's go back to the island of Bocas del Toro, to that gorgeous, calm, hot, sunny day when I was underwater tending a different experiment. As I snorkeled and basked in the warmth of the sun, I noticed something really strange beneath me. All of the fish, different species, were huddled together along one plane about a meter, just three feet, off the seafloor. Creatures that I didn't usually see out and about on the reef, they were all piled on top of each other, as far off of the seafloor as they could get. It's as if there was a barrier beneath them. So think about this for a second. What would you do if the room that you're sitting in started to fill with a toxic gas seeping up from the floor? Hopefully you'd get up and leave. Or if you couldn't leave, maybe you'd climb higher and try to get to some fresh air. That's exactly what those fish and invertebrates were doing, trying to escape hypoxic water, which is essentially toxic to them because there's no oxygen in it for them to breathe. Now imagine that your feet are stuck to the ground. You can't move, you can't escape. It's a scary thought, right? That's what happened to the corals and to the other critters that were attached to the bottom, trapped in that hypoxic water without access to oxygen. It doesn't take long for the entire habitat to suffocate. That day is burned in my memory because it's by far the scariest thing that I've seen happen on a coral reef. I've seen destruction on a reef. I've witnessed mass coral bleaching. But during this hypoxic event, in a matter of hours, everything on the sea floor in that hypoxic water was either dead or well on its way out. It's as if someone took an eraser and wiped it across the sea floor, erasing everything. I revisit those sites whenever I return to Bocas, and even though it's been several years since that fateful day, the reefs have not recovered. Corals that were hundreds of years old were wiped out in the blink of an eye, and they were lost to us forever. I couldn't ignore this, so now a major part of my research is trying to understand how corals cope with oxygen deprivation, identifying for the first time the coral species that can essentially hold their breath for the longest period of time. Because maybe, just maybe, those will be the ones that have the best chances to survive in the tough times ahead. More than 10% of coral reefs on the planet are at a high risk of experiencing one of those acute hypoxic events. And we're now aware of more events like this happening across the world, from the flower garden banks in the Gulf of Mexico to the reefs of Puerto Rico. So as I said, this isn't necessarily a happy story, but I do want to leave you with a few possible solutions that we can do to address this issue. Now, the tricky thing about envir global environmental change is that the solution is to reverse climate change. It's a big task that requires action from every one of us. We can make a difference by casting our votes and making smarter choices to reduce our carbon footprint, but sometimes this can feel overwhelming. So the message that I have for you is don't be overwhelmed. You can make a difference. We know that by making our local environment healthier, we give our fragile ecosystems a fighting chance. By reducing local human impacts, we can boost the chances for survival. And this is where what's happening in your backyard really matters. In Bocas del Toro, the reefs are overfished. The water quality is poor, nutrient pollution, sedimentation, they're rampant, resulting from land development, runoff, raw sewage outflow. So not only are the reefs fighting warming, but they're also being overgrown by seaweeds because there's no fish to keep mowing it down. They're being smothered by sediments that are in the water column. And now they're being suffocated as this oxygen depleted area continues to grow and reoccur. Now the solution to these issues are more tractable. In areas where the issues persist, we need to implement policies for tighter regulations and infrastructure to control things like nutrient use in agriculture, coastal land development, and sewage processing. Many of these big changes do need to happen at a bigger scale, so what you can do is to support lawmakers who can help see these changes through. 
but you can also do a few things to change everyday activities. So for example, a massive amount of nutrients are used to create the food that feeds cattle. You can reduce your nutrient footprint by eating less meat. And did you know that some soaps and cleaning detergents actually have nitrates and phosphates in them? So choose nutrient-free products. Fertilize your garden responsibly using environmentally friendly products. See how sewage is handled in your area and push for tighter controls. So now you've met this evil character named deoxygenation. You know what you can do to make a difference. And though they may seem like small steps, the changes that you make do matter. We wanna give our reefs a fighting chance in this global fight so we can locally improve our environments to do that. We can reduce our nutrient impacts and stop deoxygenation at its source. So perhaps I misled you a little at the beginning. I said that this was gonna be a dark story and it certainly is, but there still is hope in our fight for coral reefs and I refuse to lose that hope and you shouldn't either.